the same way that AI was underestimated, this is the same type of example, really. It is so cross-cutting, the applications of synthetic biology. I mean, basically, anything that has atoms, at some point, you will be able to build by biology. Yaron, what's going on? Carl, I've been so, so busy. Event season is picking up and I've been out on town. I know, but it's always event season in New York City. There's never a week when there is not something going on and biotech has an event every night. Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely no shortage of events. I do have a friend who is, I like to call her the Suzanne Lee of India because she's creating a community and conferences around alternative materials there. And she's coming to New York and she's like, was there anything going on? I'm like, everything is going on in New York City. So there's, there's no shortage of events. And just to give a shout out to some of the events we went to, the first event that we went to recently was the New York Bio hosted a welcome reception for Bio CEO, which was a very cool event. It happened at Spin, which is a ping pong bar. So they have ping pong tables and a bar and food, a restaurant. It's called Spin. There's a Spin in San Francisco that had a huge event for JP Morgan before the pandemic in 2020. Our friends at the Trout Group sponsored it, and it was epic. It was a huge event. All right. Spin holding it down for biotech. Thank you so much. We'll have to put that in the show notes, the link to Spin. (laughs) But it was great. There was a lot of CEOs from different stages that attended, investors, very casual on a Sunday, gearing up for bio CEO because we know that bio events, you mentioned JP Morgan, can be very overwhelming. There's a lot of people there that support the industry, that are building the industry. So it was good to welcome people from all over the world. Some of our clients from Boston, there are some from Seattle, people from France, Italy, I'm sure had showed up. And that was great. New York Bio is a very interesting organization here in New York that does a lot of advocacy for the life sciences. And they've been around for a while, right? I don't know how old they are, but I feel like I've gone to their Christmas party several Mm -hmm. times. They used to have it at the Con Edison building, which is off of Irving Place. But yeah, they're an advocacy group for the state of New York, so not just New York City. I did not attend the BioCEO spin event. Iram, you went to that, but we did see one of our clients at the J Labs Biotech XYZ mixer that happened that week, a couple of days after the spin event. Yeah, J Labs, I think you guys will hear more about. I mean, I'm very excited about the programming. They have an accelerator program that offers lab space. They are in the New York Genome Center, which is also very cool, nicely located. Again, I met amazing people. I met very young entrepreneurs. Biotech XYZ is a spin out, it's a student led organization from Cornell, but a lot of other universities are involved. And then I met some veterans, people that have been in the New York biotech scene for 20, 30 years that are on their third, fourth company. So it was great to talk to people across the board because like when I met some of the young entrepreneurs, I was like, you have to meet this person who is, and I don't want to say their names because I mean, I just met them right now. So if I get to interact with them more and learn more about what they do, I would love to talk to them, have them on because they are doing incredible things when it comes to drug development, because J-Labs is biopharma focused. So that was really great. I mean, I enjoyed it. There's a lot more events that are coming up that are going to be hosted by Biotech XYZ and J-Labs. So this is not the last you'll hear about it. Yeah. And so J-Labs is sponsored by Johnson & Johnson. They have labs all over the world. And I know that I talked to one of the people that works there. He's like, if you know any companies, send them our way. We have lab, lab space available. I don't know what they charge. I'm not being a advocate for J Labs. I like their event. I don't know if it's worth it to go there, but they do have space available. So if you're looking for lab space, it could be one of the options in New York City. I thought that was a good event. It was very well attended. The food was excellent. I think I was there for like an hour. I went mostly because you went and then also because one of our clients from Boston was there. And then at the end of last week, Symbio Beta held an annual New York City event. Last year, they had it at C16 Biosciences Lab Space. This year, they chose a cafe that is very famous for its Aperol Spritz and Negronis on tap. Cafe Dante, right in the middle of the village near NYU. And that was a great event. There was a lot of people who we knew there. The moment I walked in, John Cumbers was at the door. He was just on a podcast. 
than Kevin Flangalt of Acklid Bio, which we should get on the podcast to talk about biosecurity at some point. He was there, so we got to talk to him. But there was a lot of people. Who do you want to give shout outs to? Well, a lot of our guests were there. So we had Edward Shenderovich. Great episode. We mentioned him um, a few times because the whole body manufacturing cloud blew my mind. Our dear, dear friend, Shelby Nusad of Compound was there. When I was on my way there, New York subways crowded. There's so many people. And Shelby, she just saw me and was like, hey, what's going on? I run into her three or four times, just like randomly. This wasn't so random because we're headed to the same event. So timing wise, of course. But I have run into her randomly and she's keeping her eye out for people because she's seen me. I usually just have my headphones in, head to the ground, just like plowing through the crowd. But Shelby's paying attention. She's seeing people. She's taking names. And it's always a pleasure to see her. Great episode with her. So you should check it out. Yeah, I mean, it's just a reminder that New York City really is just a small town. And if you're (laughs) hanging out in the same scene, you're going to run into the same people, which is really what makes it very special. It was great to see Shelby. And then we also saw the guys from Not Boring, Elliot Hirschberg and Packy McCormick. And we're going to have Elliot on the podcast in a couple of weeks. So very excited about that. We spent some time talking about genome mining. And I learned the fun fact that there's only 270,000 genomes sequenced. So really like considering how much life there is on this planet, even though it sounds like a daunting number, 270,000, when you think about the trillions of things that are alive on this planet, It is a very small number. One of the things I love, I mean, you mentioned running into Shelby on the train. I love the serendipity of going to these events because we had recorded a podcast earlier that day. The podcast guest had mentioned to me, oh, you need to meet Chris Mason. I walked in and there was Chris Mason standing there. And he and I had a long conversation about space and what he's working on. It turns out that we have a lot of things in common. So he's my new best friend. Oh, yeah, that's amazing. Yep. The universe works in mysterious ways, Carl. It works in mysterious ways. That was a great event. I mean, there was a lot of serial entrepreneurs, serial successful entrepreneurs, those entrepreneurs that have failed. I'm sure there's a couple of those people in the crowd. And it was great hearing the story. Something that Shelby mentioned was that I was good at getting gossip out of people. And I think it's just because I'm curious and asking questions and hopefully give people a comfortable feeling that they're open to share stories. And there was one that was a really good one. I'll have to talk to the person to see if it's okay to share the story because it's very specific. And it's also very sensitive because there's lawyers involved in the government. It would be a great case study. It would be a great story to share. So if once I can get that green light, I will share it. Yeah, the other thing is that event was on a Friday. It was at Cafe Dante. Then it moved to GTM Bar, which is a British bar. And then I think people went to go get pizza. By then, I mean, it was relatively early in the grand scheme of things. Eight o'clock, I was ready to go home. I went home. You stayed out a little bit later than I did. But Friday is kind of a special night. Don't you do Disney on Friday nights? So my son just turned three. And Friday nights, we want to do something that was special. So what we do is in front of our TV... We have a couch, but we end up moving the couch back and putting down a blanket and have a picnic. So we order pizza and we'll put something on Disney Plus because I know that, yeah, we see the content safe and that there's so many Disney movies that have been made that I haven't watched. So there's like a big gap of movies that I just haven't seen because maybe at that point I was a teenager in college and I wasn't really watching Disney movies. But when I was a kid, Toy Story came out. So I picked that as an option and turns out that there's four Toy Stories and they get better and better, which is so interesting because sometimes there's franchises where like the second or third Back to the Future wasn't that great when they go to the West. I was like, mm. but this one, very, very clever. I watched Up. I never watched that before. The next morning, my eyes were swollen because I just cried the whole time. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. But then it reminded me of John Cumbers because when he was on our podcast recently, he mentioned that he was setting up a studio, a Pixar for biology, which... Now that I'm watching these Disney movies, it's spinning in my head. I'm like, oh, okay, the central dogma, of course, that has to be a whole movie in itself. But then you can go into proteins and each protein that is created can have its own personality. The immune system, I mentioned reading the book Immune by Philip Detmer of Hurskiscott. So like that whole book itself is written as a screenplay almost. That could be an amazing, amazing Pixar type movie. 
I don't know if you talked to John about his developments. I mean, he shared some developments with me, but I don't know if I can say publicly. We've been getting a lot of secrets that we need clearance on before we mention it. But what are your thoughts on this Disney-like entertainment for bio? I mean, I wrote about the need for a biotech media fund probably four years ago. So if you go out there and look at the blog on carlschmieder.com, which I never really talk about, there is a there is a blog post on the need for a $100 million biotech media fund. It's something I've thought about, and that was sparked by a conversation that John set up between me, Matt Ocko of DCBC, and Taryn Southern, who is a digital influencer who now works at BlackRock Neuro. And I think it's important. It's funny that you mentioned Toy Story Toy Story and Shrek, my boys only saw those in Spanish. I would play them in Spanish. So they never saw Shrek in English until they were like in their teens. And I think in Toy Story 2, there's a whole section where Buzz Lightyear is speaking in Spanish. And they were the only ones that got the joke when they went to the theater and saw it in English because they are bilingual. But you mentioned, someone pointed out that there's a Korean drama coming out on Disney Plus about cultured meat. Yeah, just a little teaser. I think it's coming out April 10th, but it's called Blood Free. It's a K-drama. So we know it's going to be good. I don't know if you've ever watched Korean dramas. Obviously, the biggest one that was on Netflix was Squid Games. Yeah. And that was just like unbelievable. So I am just excited to watch not only about culture meat. Okay, this is something that we talk about. It's something that is very topical in terms of, is it going to scale? It has a great promise of solving some of the grand climate challenges that come with livestock, agriculture, big cow, big beef. So cultured meat is a great solution if done well, but hopefully this drama points to that part. It is about the CEO of this cultured meat company. There's something that happens and I'm curious to know like how they position cultured meat. I'm not sure how far into the future it is or if it's a parallel world type of situation where maybe we started exploring cultured meat in the 50s and now it's 2024 and then it's commonplace, which sometimes I'd like that. That's for all mankind. It's an alternative present moment. So definitely excited to see that. It's going to be the last of us for the fun guy world, maybe. Let's hope. Let's hope. Let's hope it's that good. We're talking about events. We're talking about media. You're going to go this week to New Lab to this clean tech open I think several times we've spoken about our friend Kristen Ellis in the intersection between biotech and climate tech being a circle. Why are you excited to go to New Lab for this Clean Tech Open? Well, I'm excited for multiple reasons. First, New Lab is an amazing space. I mean, we've been giving them shout outs. Our friend Alex Rose, he's now a resident there. Ellen Jorgensen, who's at a new company, which we'll talk about some other time. She's also there. So it's a great space in the Navy Yard, the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Clean Tech Open holds a special place in my heart because I participated in the program in a previous life, meaning I was part of this company that converted carbon emissions into carbon nanomaterials back in 2013, 2014. And I participated in the program and it was great. I mean, it was a great program and it's going strong. It's a regional program. So if there's anybody out there that's working for a clean tech a biotech, because if you're thinking of biotech, there is, you know, again, the Venn diagram circle. So we have to think about how it's sustainable. It's a program that people should look into. Great mentors, great resources. And again, it is nationwide. So it's one to keep an eye on. And I will report back to see who's there. There's some interesting companies for those of you that are not in New York and are contemplating coming to New York, even just for an extended business trip to start meeting people and making those connections, it's a great place to be. And I think that's a great transition to our guests today. Clean tech, climate tech has been called the tech of the present, meaning that there are so many opportunities with these clean tech companies. With that, I'm super excited to introduce Dr. Tara Shirvani, who wrote a book called Plastic Eaters and Turbo Trees. First, she published it in German because she is a German speaker and German writer, lives in the UK. And the book was a bestseller. And it's actually the first mainstream book on the use of synthetic biology for climate action. Tara has worked at the European Union's Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And she's also someone like our friend Edward Shenderovich, who's very interested in biomanufacturing as a novel asset class. 
Tara had reached out to us. We ended up having some conversations with her and thought she would be a perfect guest for the podcast. So with that, let's let Tara take it away. Hi, Tara. It's a pleasure to meet you. This is our first time meeting. So we were getting a pure interview because I'm going to be really curious about what you're doing. So I'm glad you're on this podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, guys. We're super yeah. excited to have you here today. Likewise. <laughs> so I did a little bit of internet stalking and I saw your LinkedIn and you studied at the University of Oxford. You have a PhD in algae biofuels and synthetic biology, which is super impressive. What inspired you to pursue that? I remember when I was starting my PhD, I was really way too young to decide to go into the corporate world. And I was really quite curious to continue a bit research. And at the time, back in the days, algae fuels was really all the rave and all the hype about decarbonizing fuels and finding a sustainable solution to the transport problem. And I got this opportunity to look at algae fuels as a way to reduce our footprint on water and food. And Inevitably, algae is one of the first pillars of where synthetic biology met climate issues and thinking about how can we basically scale alternative green solutions to hard to abate sectors. So inevitably, the whole discussion around algae fuels, which made a lot of sense on paper, but was really super expensive in reality back in the day. There was really only one way to look at it, to scale it up. One was basically trying to increase the yields. So thinking about synthetic biology and gene editing. And the other way was finding new alternative sources, different types of strands, anything basically that turbocharges the production. So while my PhD was super exciting, <laughs> admittedly, it led to nothing and no one bought my patents or anything such as that. But it was always in the back of my head because Back in the day, the pricing of carbon and fuel was still not favorable enough to really think about biofuels at a larger scale. But what was not reality 15 odd years ago now is really very much on the heart of everyone thinking about decarbonization and meeting, meeting Paris Agreement goals. So, I mean, we've had a couple of people on here that have talked about algae, and I've said it myself, algae is the perfect biomachine because it's got like three genomes and you could probably engineer one to do something and engineer another one to do another one. Having gone through that entire biofuels bus cycle, was it heartbreaking for you? How did you come out of that and continue to be inspired? Because we're going to talk about the other things that you've done and you've had a very inspiring career to date, but how did you feel after that? You said none of your patents were bought. So what do you do after you finish that part of your life? I mean, it was mega disheartening. I have to say, you work on something for three, four years, you really pride yourself on all the hard, long nights in the lab. And then at the end, you come out and you definitely have a great degree on paper and everything. But really, the conclusion of it was it's a good idea, but it's too expensive. So I was quite disheartened at the time. And I felt like, okay, well, maybe this was just a great research project. But it's not going to have a real application, which really frustrated me. And that's why I wanted to go into real applications and in in commerce and try to see what are the real tangible projects. But it never left me. It was always in the back of my mind. When you look at problems like aviation or road transport, you really just don't want to ultimately spend the money on completely changing the infrastructure. You want to have a simple drop-in fuel alternative where you can use the system as is, but just have something that's green and sustainable. So it was always in the back of my mind it's really quite funny how with so many loops and hoops, it came back to become front, left and center now. Not only, as you said, algae for fuel, but also for food, cosmetics and a whole host of different applications. Yeah, that's great. And clearly you've learned a lot about biofuels and synthetic biology that is very interesting to a lot of people working in climate and finance. You wrote a couple of books. Can you tell us what inspired you to write your first book? your recent book. And I know the first book was actually very successful. So congratulations. It was a bestseller in Germany and Austria. Tell us what inspired you to write the book and what was it about? The book is called Plastic Eaters and Turbo Trees. It's now translated into English and first was written in German. 
the reason why I started writing the book was twofold. On the one hand, I got completely, with time, very frustrated with trying to explain to people what on earth synthetic biology is and why they should care about it and why is this more important than the applications in pharma. It was always about pharma, pharma, pharma and biotech, but it never spilled over into other applications that have to do with climate and sustainability. And I would lose people really quickly after the third sentence, and you start using the word gene and editing, people were already going blank. It was trying to find writing a mainstream book that really grabs the wider understanding of the population to understand, hey, this is really important. This is even more important than the evolution of the personal computer that we've seen. I mean, we're really at the tipping point of seeing a complete new industrial revolution. Guys, pay attention. This is going to change the game. That book, I think, was really important because it opened people's minds. And there was a big aha moment where many, many people, as you know, still don't really believe all the opportunities that come with this world. That was one reason. The second reason was in my career, I started in academia, studied at Oxford, and then moved very much into finance. And at some point in my whirlwind career, I find myself at a hedge fund based out of London. And of all people, the hedge fund was like, we need to look at synthetic biology as the next investment opportunity. I've always learned that when the banks and when people with deep pockets start caring about things that maybe 10, 15 years ago was something just for research and academia, you know things are happening and things are moving fast. So it really felt like the opportune moment to bring this topic more to the mainstream. Now, did you write the book while you were at the hedge fund or what was the sequence of events? We did a lot of research. So the hedge fund was investing into synthetic biology as an investment theme very much thinking around applications around food and fuel and materials. And it was really interesting because you get a very different perspective, having been very much in academia, looking at why these technologies would and wouldn't work. Then when you're in a financial institution, look at it much more as in why and why not would anyone bring this to scale? How do you commercialize it? Is this ready? Is this going to fly? Is this going to be the next Amazon, this company, X, Y, and Z? And I think that that was a really an interesting new facet to look at disruption and look at basically cost curves and how these technologies become viable. Hedge funds as they are, when it goes really well, it goes really well. When it goes bad, it goes bad extremely quickly. And after the hedge fund didn't exist as such anymore, it was a really good time after that to pause and say, okay, this is really a topic worth elaborating on for everyone, basically, and not just one part that is interested in the financial application or the other part that is interested in the scientific application of it. This is something, guys, like the next AI revolution, we have to pay a lot of attention to. So you mentioned that the hedge funds are paying attention, that they're looking at the different applications of synthetic biology, whether it's food, fuels, materials. But where do you see the bulk of the money going today in synthetic biology? Like, What is the promising industry that is paving the way for synthetic biology today? What we've seen the last few years was really bad for synthetic biologies. And the majority of the companies basically went bust because of all the high interest rates and growth companies really changed in terms of their interest to the market. So I think there's that part to that. So there wasn't much interest in it. That's why you see, I think now more and more companies pivoting back into pharma, where there is really much more of a mature value proposition and companies are more willing to invest in that kind of infrastructure. But I think outside of pharma, what you see is the cost curves are coming dramatically down for the applications of these new technologies. First and foremost, of course, in the food sector. So we see very much around flavors, food ingredients, alternative meats. Those, I think, are the sectors where you already see a more mature infrastructure and an interest in really applying these technologies. But it's very quickly and not in a linear way, but very much in an exponential way. I think this disruption is moving on to other sectors. Cosmetics, we've seen it. Materials, carbon capture solutions. Things are happening really fast. And it's for sure just a matter of time until we reach the rise cost function, where this has become much more a game of scale rather than just pilots here and there. And that, I think, is something that people are watching very carefully to see when that tipping point is going to be reached. 
Yeah, I think it's super interesting that you mentioned that, Tara, because as we record this, we just saw that Novo Holdings, one of the biggest companies in the world, just bought Catalent, which was a big biomanufacturing firm. The story that's being told is that Novo bought Catalent because they offer them infrastructure for producing more Ozembic slash Wegovy these weight loss drugs. But the narrative that's happening behind the scenes is that Catalan was a big biomanufacturer for the entire pharmaceutical industry. And so the question is, is there enough infrastructure to serve the industry? What happens to all those contracts that pharma had with Catalan? Is Novo suddenly going to become this powerhouse also of biomanufacturing? And I see that as being separate from the narrative of hey, we need more biomanufacturing as an infrastructure, as an asset class to be developed. The feeling that I'm getting is we still don't have enough of it and we are a long way off from having enough of it. I'm kind of curious, what do you see or what are you thinking? No, I totally agree with you. I think we're far off and there's huge regional differences on top of that, of how much governments are willing to invest into infrastructure and institutions in order to drive this revolution, I would say, at a scale. And I think that's very true. I think we're still at this inflection point where scale comes down with time. The applications basically just make more sense in some sectors than the others for now. But I do see that these trends are really moving in an exponential way, as I said, rather than a linear way. And these platform companies, whether that's Ginkgo Bioworks or Novo, those are really the ones where it's just a matter of offering the platforms and also sectors being mature and ready to understand that they can use these tools in order to really advance and find either alternatives or higher grade materials and be open to using those solutions as well. So I think that there's a push and pull and the jury is still out, I would say. Something that I think on top of it that we very rarely talk about when it comes to financing these biomanufacturing solutions, whether that's infrastructure or individual companies, is the opportunities of blended finance. So blended finance around working with public-private partnerships, sustainability-linked products such as green bonds, they've been extremely successful in basically bringing finance at scale for projects that have an environmental component and also very much in the space of impact investing. We see a lot of green bonds and sustainability finance links for adaptation and resilience and transition finance themes. But we have not looked at this at all for synthetic biology or bioeconomy themes. And those are very much financial tools that will really ensure that also investors get access to the yields that they will need in order to feel comfortable and secure in order to invest in those solutions. So I think there's plenty actually of solutions and metrics and tools available from the climate finance side that has not even woken up yet to all of these great opportunities that are there in terms of bankable projects. And it really matters now to fast track that because in terms of climate, we know we're very much running out of time if we want to continue having a livable planet. Yeah, that's really well said. And thank you for sharing your perspective there. Hi, a quick shout out to our sponsor, Messaging Lab, the force multiplier for biotech. Your biotech company is making the world a better place. You know that, we know that. But does the world? There's a big reason why some biotech companies attract investors, sign up customers, and get attention. That reason is strategic communications. At Messaging Lab, we translate complex science and economics into compelling narratives. And we have done that for the most successful biotech companies across healthcare, agriculture, personal care and beauty, materials, and the list goes on. We're here to make sure your ideas not only get heard, but resonate with your audience. So if it's time to amplify your company's voice, visit messaginglab.com to explore how we can elevate your story and grow your business. So you mentioned blended finance, and you also mentioned like governments investing in infrastructure for synthetic biology. And are you based in Germany? I'm based in London. But yeah. you have a view of Europe. So I'm yes. assuming that since you're there, you have an eye on what's going on in Europe. What has Europe done in terms of providing any type of infrastructure for, and I know you mentioned there's not a lot in synthetic biology, but for climate projects. And can you point to an example of where blended finance worked and what lessons can we learn for the world of not just synthetic biology, but biotech for this whole growth of bioeconomy? What example can we point to that is a good one? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of examples. Green bonds have really gained a lot of traction as a mean of financing climate mitigation and adaptation projects uh, over the last years. Issuance volumes are really at an all time high. And these instruments really provide investors with opportunities to allocate capital towards these environmentally beneficial projects, while at the same time generating competitive financial returns. So when it comes to, for example, adaptation finance, and so for example, if you want to build resilience against climate change impacts or blue economies or nature-based solutions, those are types of projects that very easily actually intersect with a lot of themes of the bioeconomy, with a lot of themes of the applications of synthetic biology. You know, companies like Carbios that are basically focusing on growing plastic eating bacteria, recycling, circular economies. Those are all types of examples of bio-based materials and products and technologies that really offer solutions that can mitigate climate related risks, whether that is food security, plastics reduction, water scarcity, extreme weather events, carbon capture solutions. And it's just a matter of bringing the financiers, the investors together, having them understand that these solutions and these types of projects are now on the rise and how you package that in order to make bankable projects out of it. So that is something that is also very well housed in Europe. There's a lot of investment push that's going into that direction. And there's a lot of experience and a lot of willingness that is also partly driven by regulation. So the EU is very much pushing with different types of environmentally friendly regulations and policies to be clear about what every company is doing around sustainability and where they're putting their money. So that is something that is, I think, pushing very well. But of course, the difference between Europe and the US is Europe is using more the stick rather than the carrot approach in order to get companies to really push for that. I'll bet now they want to invest more finance into it. But when you look at it vis-a-vis -vis what's happening in the U.S. with the Buy Economy Act, with the IRA, all of those policies, it's a whole different approach to that. And we now see Europe is trying to push faster than anticipated in terms of putting more financing out and also in terms of getting the regulation that goes with really allowing these companies to scale to be state of the art that allows them really to flourish from academia into the real world. I'm curious, Tara, do you think that on the banking side, so I'm thinking about Europe, we can talk about the U.S. separately. They understand these regulations are being pushed by the EU to, let's just say, green the economy, and they are investing in those things. But do they understand what does synthetic biology do to impact that greening of the economy? Is there a disconnect there? Oh, definitely. I think there definitely is a disconnect. And not only that, it's a missed opportunity, a trillion dollar missed opportunity that we haven't really grasped yet. And I think that partly has to do with the same way that AI was underestimated. This is the same type of example, really. It is so cross-cutting, the applications of synthetic biology. I mean, basically, Anything that you has atoms, at some point, you will be able to build by biology. For people to wrap their head around it and understand that we're really talking here about a complete shift in production, manufacturing, the way we live and our clothes and eat and many other things, is still something I think that people have to wrap their heads around it. And I think that's really the challenge to also bring to investors on one hand to be able for them to understand what the opportunities are. That's one. And then, of course, on the second side, there is the same issue that we've seen, for example, with electrification of cars and photovoltaics, that most of the time the problem is that banks, when you talk to them about disruption and when you talk to them about exponential growth of technologies, simply because they're thinking mostly in historic projections. So whatever was happening five years ago, you draw it back and forward the same assumptions for the future. And as we know, this is just not the case. So you continuously have not everyone, but many of the banks underestimate these transformation in scale and scope. And I think it's the same with synthetic biology. We're not there yet, and it's not fully grasped yet the opportunities and the potential that this new way of building things with biology is really going to bring to us. So we're talking about investors and banks, but I love the fact that you talked about dangling the carrot in front of the horse and the stick. And the stick is a representation of how Europe works and the carrot 
could be the representation for U.S. But let's also talk about the entrepreneurs, the people that have to create these products, that have to sell them. And one of the things that we have talked about a lot on this podcast is buy materials, especially recently, because Carl had gone to buy a fabricate and we were able to get a lot of perspective on what was happening in the buy material space. And the big thing that comes up is the supply chain. How do you bring the costs down to be comparable to that of petrochemicals? The big thing is putting a price on carbon. It's not happening here in the U.S. too much. I believe it's happening in Europe. I do know of some projects, but can you share a little bit of what you're seeing in terms of being cost competitive, meaning that having synthetic biology or even biotech products being cost competitive uh, against petrochemical products? Yeah, I think that's really something that everyone's looking at. Once we put a, a fair cost on carbon, once we put and consider all the shadow pricing that goes with it and all the externalities and the external costs that come with this environmental footprint, everything's going to be a whole different game. We're talking about a whole different pricing and things are going to churn rapidly. One of the things in Europe that is really quite promising is now the expansion of CBAM, the carbon border adjustment pricing mechanism, where basically you're really trying to, on a regulatory level, trying to account for more and more sectors that are part of the carbon market in Europe, the EU ETS, and their carbon footprint. So it's starting slowly, slowly it starts with more heavy to abate sectors like metals and mining, but it's slowly and surely moving more and more into all the other sectors. So whether that's transport, municipal, et cetera, et cetera. And this CBAM technologies and these approaches really means that ultimately we want to avoid carbon leakage. We want to avoid that People that come to Europe and think that, oh, here it's more expensive in terms of cost of carbon to produce product X, Y, Z, not going to decide to then go to another country where the environmental policies are much more lax and there's basically carbon leakage and we just have the same pollution just on the other side of the continent, so to speak. And I think those are like movements that we're seeing more and more trying to put a handle and are trying to put considerations around carbon footprints. That is an opportunity, I think, that also is going to ultimately expand into all these bio-based materials, because it is true that the majority of them are still very much at this tipping point where they lack the scale to really be cost competitive on one side. And also the other side is there's not enough carbon finance, really, and carbon taxation that goes into it. But slowly and surely, I think things are going to move. And you see also now as part of the discussions around COP28 and how we're moving into next year's COP29, those topics are becoming more and more front and center for EU policymakers. And inevitably, what we're seeing, even though there is a lot of political disagreements, I would call it in the U.S., a lot of the policy making and decision making in the U.S. is taking inspiration when it comes to the environmental policies that they're going to take. So they may be a few years behind on some of these themes, but it's coming up. And ultimately, there is a direction that is already foreseeable for the market, I think, for when carbon is going to be priced more adequately. And that is going to spill into bio-based materials inevitably in one shape or the other. I think it's super interesting because there's been like a anti-ESG movement. For those who don't know, ESG is the way of looking at finance and you have funds that have been set up around it. And even the way banks are investing, they try to comply with these ESG requirements. And there's been a lot of pushbacks. I think most notably, Texas has been trying to ban banks that use ESG as a yardstick for their investments. But the narrative has also shifted in that now you're seeing banks saying, look, if you prevent us from investing in ESG, what you're doing is you're preventing us from investing in innovation. And that's innovation across the board, not just in biotech. I wonder how that peppers what you're thinking about. It might be different in Europe, but in the U.S., given the size, and we are, I'm going to say, still probably the first biggest economy, for sure, first or second with China. But that whole anti-ESG thing is troubling because it does prevent innovation from happening. Just curious what your thoughts are on that, Tara. It's two levels, I would say. One of it is the political discussions that you have, of course, as part of the current debates around 
the electorate and the next presidential can candidate and the discussions around that. So at the policy level, there is a lot, of course, pushback from Republicans at different states, as you said, much stronger than in others. And that trickles down, I think, into the pressure that a lot of these investment firms feel and how open they can be about their aspirations and their interest of spending more into ESG. So there's this one level that is the political discussions and what is portrayed to the outside world and the media and what the media is picking up. And that, of course, has a feedback loop of pressure back into the banks and the, the investment houses. But then there's this underlying layer of what is really happening in the real economy. So, for example, when you look at the evidence of which states actually tapped in most into the funding that came out of the Inflation Reduction Act, it's actually those com those states that are most Republican focused, Texas being one of them, being the one that really is going full front in terms of investing in solar power and residential solar investments. And there is a difference. So you can see, I think, that there is a difference between what's happening in the real economy, how much they are tapping into these investments, and then what's happening at the political level in terms of discussion. And those things are clearly not working in tandem at the moment. And the same as I think you can see also in a lot of these asset management larger companies that while they may not be giving out a lot of research or projects or products, some do, some others don't, a lot is still happening internally, I think. And it's just a matter about the mood changing now. And we went to Davos and we came out and said, okay, ESG is dead and people don't want to use those three letters anymore. And it's become kind of a toxic word, but you can label it as it you want. The investments, the innovation, the projects don't go away. The intention is still the same. You can label it whatever you want. It's just a matter and a question of how we basically can now scale those things in a very rapid and fast amount of time in order to really make meaningful change if we want to live on a 1.5 degree planet. So Tara, you co-founded the Climate Crisis Advocacy Group, which focuses on advising policymakers on climate action. Could you elaborate on key challenges and opportunities you see in integrating synthetic biology into global climate strategies? And how does your advisory group in particular address these issues? How does it work? Yeah, so the Climate Crisis Advisory Group, they're very much focused on advising policymakers and climate action on the needs of decarbonizing the global economy. The mantra is, is basically we want to work around the three R's. The R's are we have to rapidly reduce our carbon footprint. So we have to rapidly bring down CO2 emissions by up to 90 percent. At the same time, we have to remove the excess CO2 that is in the atmosphere. So we're thinking about all kinds of air capture technologies. So whether there is, is nature based or whether that is technology based. So removing the carbon that is already pumped over the last 20 odd plus years into the atmosphere, we have to get rid of that too. And then it's about repair. So how can we repair the planetary tipping points that are either now at the risk of tipping and then not being reversible or some that have already passed the moment of being sustainable as such. And those three R's, I think is the areas to so reduce, remove and repair are areas where I think we need to focus most when it comes to climate action, whether that's mitigation and adaptation in order to be able to live within a 1.5 degree planet. And it's really funny because you always go to these COP meetings and they talk about 1.5 as if it's a political compromise or a nice to have. But people don't understand that actually, if you would move to a two degree world, let's say, that comes just with profound environmental challenges. And in fact, the last time we actually lived in a planet that had more than two degree warming was around two to four million years ago. So, I mean, we didn't even have oxygen back then. And we talk about it very casually of we're moving to a two degree world. And that's, I think, something where synthetic biology really tackles all three of those. If you think of companies like Lanza Tech, those are the companies that focus really on recycling CO2 and reducing the CO2 that is already out in the atmosphere. I mean, it's exactly that. At the same time, repair, there are many companies that are really looking at bioremediation and cleaning up oceans with the help of biology and the help of synthetic biology. And the same would reduce everything that has to do with basically whether that is textile manufacturing, 
biofabrication, all of these applications. So I think synthetic biology, it's interesting because in Europe, I feel like synthetic biology is seen very much in some countries more than others, solely under the banner of GMO and applications of gene editing to agriculture, which has a really, really bad rep in some countries and gets outright Bands, but the applications are just so much fast and so much more profound than all these different segments of sustainability that is still completely underestimated. And I think that if we basically want to live in a livable planet, but without giving up our freedoms and without giving up our choice of what we want to do, but decouple from fossil fuels, we can only do this with synthetic biology. There's really no other way that we continue to live as we are at the lifestyle that we have without the help of synthetic biology. And that I think is something that still needs to trickle in, but it's the way it is. And it's quite funny because when you look at some countries, they're already so depending on the applications of synthetic biology, they just don't talk about it. Yeah, can you give us an example of one of those countries that are leveraging synthetic biology today? Yeah, one of the examples is Germany that comes to mind. So Germany, for example, they're very quiet about whatever they're doing around synthetic biology and GMO. It's a very hush-hush topic. You would never find a politician advocate about synthetic biology. That's basically signing your own death certificate. But the reality is animal food production. I mean, 90% of animal food is imported from Latin America to Germany. 90% of that food is made with GMO enhanced soybeans and agricultural crop products. The whole country is fully reliant on those imports. So while you are fully reliant on it, you don't say no to that, but you really are very uncomfortable admitting to it domestically or producing it domestically, but you're very happy to import all of it. And of course, those are slightly hypercritical situations because you find yourself in a position where the academics and the scientific community is saying, hey, biotech equals sustainability. This goes hand in hand, but then the population doesn't see it as such. They're still very much haunted by all the bad rep and all the things that happen with GMO and Monsanto and all of that. But at the same time, they're completely reliant on it. I think things that we have to work through and be more open and transparent about. So, Tara, you also have received some really impressive awards. You're an Aviva Women of the Future Award winner. You're a Forbes 30 under 30. You've been recognized for making significant contributions to the field. How do you hope to inspire the next generation to pursue careers in sustainability, finance, and disruptive technologies like Symbio? What I find really exciting is highlighting this intersectionality of all these sectors and these critical roles in addressing all these global challenges. I think the days are gone where it was like, you're an engineer, you learn about fixing, I don't know, whatever, you're fixing like the car to be more renewable or you're working on one type of technology, you only work in one sector and that's it all your life. We've moved now to a world where everything is intersectional. And if you really want to have a grasp about what's the next wave of applications and solutions, whether that's technology or biotech or sustainability, you have to have a cross-cutting approach to it. And that's something which is so important and we're missing. This is really important also for the next generation of young people to understand that, yes, it makes a lot of sense and there's a lot of reason to go out on the streets and demonstrate and be very vocal about what we need to do about climate. But we also need to think about solutions that are able to really be applied in a just and equitable way, not only in Europe or the US, but also in the emerging markets world, so to speak. Yeah, that's amazing. And that's cool that you're on Forbes 30 under 30. You have a very extensive career. So I'm curious, was that on the finance side, the climate side, the policy side? What was the recognition specifically for? It was on the environmental side back in the day when I was at the World Bank, where I was really working very much on in financing climate technologies and climate solutions for emerging markets, mostly Africa and East Asia. And that was a time where I was so fortunate to have this recognition because it really shed so much light on this tremendous amount of work that all my team was doing. Of course, it was not just me. And it's always good to have a little bit of spotlight on you because then you can really shed more light on all the important projects that you do. And if they get financing, then everyone's happy and I'm happy too. 
That's awesome. So thinking ahead in terms of like what's got you excited and hopeful for the future of synthetic biology and the bioeconomy, what has you happy? What is really exciting is all the trends that we're seeing to use synthetic biology at a large scale transformation of the economy. We talked about this a lot, Carl, the opportunities of basically decarbonizing large scale supply chains. The idea to think that we're at an inflection point, maybe not now, but let's say five years out where we can produce a lot of the goods that we have now more domestically, more onshoring through just biomanufacturing next door in areas which are now basically not used and are in areas where there's a lot of stranded assets. Let's think about, for example, fossil fuel production that can be transformed. And instead of shipping your cement all the way from Eastern Europe or Asia with a lot of costs, with a lot of transport expenses, a lot of CO2 emissions halfway across the world, now you can use just the tiny power of bacteria and enzymes and all types of biological tools and grow these for yourself, basically, to caricature in your backyard. Those things, I think, are really profound shifts in trade volumes and trade flows that really will have huge implications for a lot of the incumbent industries and for many of the products that we see today. And I think that's really exciting because those trends are really structural trends and shifts that are completely underestimated. But we've seen this very much with 3D printing, with the onsets of robotics, many of those solutions, that it's just a matter of time once biology becomes more into the forefront of how it can really make a material and substantial difference in the way we produce everyday goods. Yeah, that's great. I mean, the future looks bright only if we all have the motivation and intention to take those steps. We have the tools, we just need the will to get there. But there are lots of companies doing great things. And since you have this Symbio background, it's in your DNA, no pun intended. You're looking at all these companies. Which company is really on top of your mind? Which companies do you admire and why? What I'm spending a lot of time on now at the moment is very much thinking about circular economy for plastics. This whole problem that we're having around the plastic use and this huge amount of plastics that we're using, these one type, one solution plastics that we're not really able to recycle. What are the opportunities that biology is offering us to clean up the oceans and to basically clean up the waste that we have now? without giving up the luxury and the freedoms that the plastic has been giving us. So companies like Carbios, for example, I think is very interesting as an approach and all types of solutions that helps us create alternative design solutions to packaging that are built by biology and then give us a new avenue to move away from recycling because recycling ultimately is a flawed concept, so to speak. That is something I think that is really, really interesting. And we have not even vaguely scratched the surface of the potential that really is available in this space. Yeah, it's super interesting. We've got a couple of podcasts that are coming up that are talking to some of these materials people who are really focused on solving the plastic and this recycling problem. So I'm heartened that you're previewing our, you're doing our work for us. (laughs) Send them over to me. This has been a great conversation. I mean, it's very interesting that you're working in the space. It's absolutely needed to look at how do we look at climate, biology, finance. Finance is the biggest thing. We do talk to a lot of entrepreneurs. They're always looking for funding. And whether that's coming from investors or sometimes directly from customers, which I definitely think that's the best way to do it if you can. You get money directly from customers to fund your operation. And then from governments, this public partnership, I hope that becomes more available to entrepreneurs so that they can really solve some of these challenging issues when it comes to producing products and cleaning up our environment and making sure we stay below that 1.5 degree warming number. I wish we looked at that number more seriously and hopefully with the work that you're doing, the work that we're doing to make this more mainstream, it is becoming mainstream, but we need to provide the tools for people to understand what they can do as individuals and from the work that they do in the day to day. So I really applaud you and I really want to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. No, I thank you guys. I love the podcast. I'm an avid fan. So you guys are doing great. Keep bringing out all this great content. It makes all the difference. Thank you so much, Tara. We really enjoyed the conversation today.
Thanks, guys. Have a great Friday. So, Carl, what did you think about that interview? Tara is so smart, and she fits right into that. What I said at the beginning in our intro is that she's part of our series of climate tech entrepreneurs, thought leaders, because of that intersection between climate tech and biotech. And I'm going to start calling that the Kristen Ellis Circle. It's no longer a Venn diagram. We're going to rename it the Kristen Ellis Circle. One thing about Tara that I've noticed is since we've gotten to know her, she's doing a lot more posts on LinkedIn. She's been posting something called Charts That Matter, which I've been very impressed by. One is an example of what are nature-based solutions and what does that actually mean when it comes to using solutions from nature that have the potential to address global challenges like human health, disaster risk reduction, and what kind of economic benefits do they provide? If you're interested in anything like that, Tara does a really good job of presenting graphically how biotech impacts the climate. Iran, what did you think? She gave a high-level overview of what's the state of climate tech investing and what's going on in different countries and you know, what policies need to be in place. And I would love to have her back on and talk about what specific policies are working in what countries. We did ask her a little bit about that, but just to dig into it a bit deeper, because again, in a previous life, I was part of this energy and environmental policy network. So I have this intimate look into policy recommendation writing, which I did on the energy and environmental side of things. But I would love to learn more about the Synbio side. What are the policies that are coming up to support synthetic biology as a solution to climate change? What's going on there? I mean, I know, for example, there's been a lot of flip-flopping on what is a GMO, what is not a GMO. Is a GMO an organism that has gone under high throughput mutagenesis? So the genes are being changed just by introducing it to stressful situations. It's just about accelerated evolution of a plant to some type of environment. And that was actually considered a GMO in the EU, but it's not anymore. I'm just really curious to see what is a policy that's working, what part of the world, and I would love to talk to Tara about that more. You bring up this mutagenesis, and the example that I always use when it comes to mutation bred varieties of fruit is the Rio Red Pink Grapefruit, which was developed by treating grapefruit seeds with thermal neutrons, in other words, a form of radiation. And that mutation gave that fruit its color, which is bright pink, and juiciness. So it is widely consumed by a lot of people, and probably most people don't realize that grapefruit was the product of controlled mutagenesis. I bet there's people out there who are more pro that kind of genetic modification versus the precise genetic editing of plants or people through technologies like CRISPR. Yeah. What I want to say on the policy side, too, is that there's a lot of bioremediation companies coming online. I mean, we have our friends at Alonia, Nicole Richards and her team that are using biology to clean up PFAS and 1,4-dioxane. Great, great company. I recommend listening to that episode. And there's a few other companies that are coming online. And recently, I spoke with a friend of mine who works at Rio Tinto, the biggest mining company in the world. I think they're the biggest, but they definitely have a big footprint. But I'm saying that because mining itself can have toxic outcomes from that process. We know that petrochemicals also do. But what policies are going to be in place for using biology to clean up the environment? The big issue right now that it's happening in the U.S. is that when mines are closed, they're just sitting there, they're dormant, there's some liability. The companies, if they clean up and something happens, they're liable for that. So there's a new legislation coming out. It's called the Good Samaritan Remediation of Abandoned Hard Rock Mines Act. It's to basically de-risk any type of cleanup so that if something happens, for example, let's just say one of the bioremediation companies were cleaning up and there was some type of issue that occurred and someone wanted to sue that company, that wouldn't happen. That wouldn't happen. That would remove any liability from solution-oriented organizations that are trying to clean up and maybe there's something unexpected that happened. 
but that would open up the doors to take all these mining sites to be able to reclaim them, regenerate them and make them to a useful space on the planet. Yeah, and I didn't read it yet, but I did notice that there was a headline from this week's genetic engineering news that said competition to destroy forever chemicals heats up. And the subhead was clean tech startups vie for a piece of the PFAS destruction market. So clearly there's a lot going on in that space. I'll have to check out the article and either write about it for LinkedIn. Yeah, I think we'll be seeing that there's a lot of chemicals and products that we've been just green lighting and using and they have you know, deteriorous effects in our lives. Unfortunately, we didn't do the full LCA when these products were coming online and they were being made in large, large, large quantities distributed all over the planet. And then we're like, oops. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. And that's what we're living with right now. We'll have to keep an eye on the PFAS destruction world. Yeah. Well, I don't know if there's anything else. Is that the pod? That's the pod. We hope some people will be inspired to come to Sinbio Beta. If you're interested in coming to Sinbio Beta this year, we have a special promo code, Grow Everything. Just type it in as you register for the event. We hope to see you there. It is great. You will leapfrog into the industry just by meeting the people that attend. And one more thing that we would love your support for is please write us a review that really helps get our podcast recognized by people as they search for synthetic biology, biotech. There are a lot of biotech podcasts out there. A lot of them are very deep PhD level discussions, but ours are try to keep friendly. So just give us a little review and let's get more listeners to join the conversation. Yeah. All right. Well, we will talk to you guys next week. See you later. 